Hello everyone, I'm Robin Pearson, and I'm here to show you what remains of the second largest Byzantine church in Istanbul, the Ahir Irene. Hagia Irene, or the Ahir Irene, means holy peace, and a church dedicated to God's holy peace was established on this spot during the reign of Constantine I to act as the city's cathedral. About 30 years later, the church of the Hagia Sophia, or Holy Wisdom, was built next door, and the Ahia Irene was forever relegated to be the junior partner to its larger neighbour. The two churches were administered together by the patriarch and his clergy. The Ahia Irene became a sort of reserve cathedral for times when the Ahia Sophia was undergoing renovation, or indeed when it was destroyed completely, as it was after riots in 404 and 532 AD. The riots of 532 were the famous Nika riots, which managed to torch most of downtown Constantinople, including both the Hagia Sophia and Irene. The buildings we see today were both commissioned by the Emperor Justinian as he remodelled the city. The Hagia Irene was then rocked again in 740 AD, when a massive earthquake struck Constantinople. The building had to be remade and redecorated by the iconoclast emperor Constantine V. The Ahia Irene pops up from time to time in our sources when church councils or other events needed to be held somewhere other than the Ahia Sophia, but otherwise it kept a low profile for the rest of the Byzantine era. After the conquest of the city by the Ottomans in 1453, the building received a slice of luck that would preserve it for us to enjoy. Sultan Mehmet II chose to build his new palace here, in this part of the city. As defensive walls went up around the top Kapi palace, the Ahir Irene fell just within their embrace. This decision ended up saving the building from either destruction or conversion. The sultans had no need for another mosque, and so the Ahir Irene was handed over to the Janissaries, the imperial guards who occupied this quarter of the palace. They turned the Church of Holy Peace into an armory. It would house their weapons for the next 400 years. After the Janissaries were disbanded in the 19th century, the building was turned into a museum, housing antiquities from across the city. It was only in 1946 that its collections were moved elsewhere, allowing scholars in to research the history of the building. The Ahir Irene then became a renowned concert venue, its splendid acoustics being enjoyed by audiences throughout the 20th century. It was actually only in 2014 that the building was finally opened up to daily visits from tourists, just in time for my arrival four years later. I couldn't take my tripod inside the Topkapi Palace, so I don't have ideal shots of the church from the outside, but hopefully you can tell that it is a huge construction. It's 57 metres long and 32 metres wide. It is comfortably the second largest Byzantine church still standing in Istanbul. It's only the gigantic size of the Hagia Sophia, just 110 metres away, that has left it in the shade. The construction of the Topkapi Palace and other buildings in the area has raised the level of the ground outside the church by about 5 metres. This means that we have to enter the building through this Ottoman porch, rather than the entrance which the Byzantines would have used. We then make our way down a dark rampway to reach the level of the interior. Inside, we arrive at the back of the church looking towards the apse. The lower portions of the church seem to have survived the worst ravages of the earthquake of 740 AD. So what you see here is roughly what Justinian built back in the 6th century. If you take a look at these columns, you can see monograms featuring the initials of Justinian and his wife Theodora, as well as their imperial titles. Similar monograms mark the columns in the Hagia Sophia. It was further up that major restoration took place, It's difficult to get a good shot of the upper portions of the church because of this huge net, 
installed to stop pigeons from ruining the floor. Since the doors are open all day, it's hard to keep the birds out. Hopefully, though, you can see the outline of the huge dome 35 metres above us. Initially, the building was designed along similar lines to the Hagia Sophia, with the dome sitting directly over the nave. This can leave the dome without adequate support and may have contributed to its collapse during the 740 earthquake. So Constantine V's engineers added four bracing vaults around the dome to help carry its immense weight. This was an important innovation and would inform future Byzantine church building. As you can see, the decoration we'd normally associate with a Byzantine church has largely disappeared. If you search in the aisles, you can find faded crosses and patterns that would once have decorated every surface. Over here, you can see colours that are reminiscent of the decoration of the Hagia Sophia. Fortunately, though, the decoration of the apse has remained in place, and though it may not look that exciting, it is another vital piece of the Byzantine puzzle. During the 8th and 9th centuries, the Byzantines engaged in a major debate over the place of images in Christian worship. Those who felt that images verged on idolatry were known as iconoclasts and advocated for their removal from churches. Constantine V, the emperor who rebuilt the Ahia Irene, was an iconoclast. So here, in the apse, we see his vision for church decoration. It is sparse compared to the style that would ultimately prevail. The iconoclasts argued that the only representations of Christ that should be acceptable were the bread and wine taken during the Eucharist, or the cross itself. There was also a strong political element to this choice. The cross had long featured on Roman military banners and was the ultimate symbol of resistance to the rising power of Islam. Despite the simplicity of the design, the mosaic shows a high level of craftsmanship. The arms of the cross are not actually horizontal, they curve downwards, they have been carefully calibrated to compensate for the curve of the apse itself so that they appear horizontal to the congregation. The cross is bordered by two biblical quotes, one from Amos, the other from the Psalms. When the iconophiles triumphed, they would destroy much of what the iconoclasts had created, and eventually they would cover every Byzantine church with images. So the survival of this mosaic gives us a rare insight into that crucial ideological struggle and a glimpse of what an alternative history might have looked like. Below the cross is another rare find. These seats are the only surviving synthronon in Istanbul. This is where the clergy would sit during church services. This reconstruction shows you how it would have functioned with the bishop's chair in the centre and the altar just in front of them. With the conversion of Constantinople's churches into mosques, no other synthronon has survived. This handy reconstruction also shows us the chancel screen, that row of columns separating the altar from the nave, or naos. We know that Constantine V had a new screen added when he renovated the church. How do we know this? because at some point that screen was taken apart and its pieces used to help hold these columns up. Confirmation comes from this monogram, which has been identified as that of Constantine V himself. If you make your way to the back of the church, you can see some interesting things through this window. This is where the Byzantines would have entered the church, and if we look from above, we can see that this huge courtyard sits to the west of the church. Sadly, it's been closed for some time, despite housing a collection of Byzantine mosaics, as well as these imperial sarcophagi. The porphyry these tombs are made from was reserved for the earliest emperors of Byzantium. A member of the Constantinian or Theodosian houses was probably buried inside. These pieces seem to have been left behind from the time when the building was a museum. I hope at some point the atrium will be open to the public again and it would be lovely to be allowed up into the galleries to admire the entire building from, well, a bird's eye view. In 
In order to visit the Ahia Irene, you need to pay to enter the Topkapi Palace, and then pay again at the church, uh, but the entry fee is not expensive. If you're really interested, you might want to explore outside where you can. Remnants from the Byzantine era have been left lying around the church from various excavations in this region. Now that you're inside the Top Kapi Palace, I imagine you'll visit the Seat of the Sultans, so keep an eye out for these gigantic pieces from Roman columns that lie around the gardens. Check out my video on the forums for more information. From the palace, you can also pay to enter the Istanbul Archaeological Museum, which is a must-visit. If you'd like more detailed information about the Ahia Irene, then visit thebyzantinelegacy.com. It's a fantastic website providing breakdowns of the Byzantine buildings that can still be seen today, and there you'll find most of the still images and sketches used in these videos. <laughs>